Kate Nesbitt is a doctoral candidate in English studying 19th century British literature and on staff with the University of Iowa Writing Center. She's currently teaching general education literature at the University of Iowa and has designed and instructed courses on themes including technical knowledge, literature, media, and information. Kate studies recitation, elocution, and oral reading practices in Victorian England and is currently working on her dissertation on the 19th century practice of reading aloud at home. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for doing this project. Hello, this is Kate Nesbitt with the Writing Center here at the University of Iowa and I'm going to offer you some writing support for some of your upcoming papers and other writing assignments. So today on our agenda we will cover identifying a research topic and question, structuring or how to structure a scientific paper, how to approach your project and organize your work time, strategies for scientific writing style, revising and editing tips, and briefly a discussion of APA citation. I hope that this uh, presentation will be helpful for you, but there of course are going to be questions that you don't have, and if you would like additional support, I encourage you to come visit us at the Writing Center um, located in 110 EPB. In order to make an appointment at the Writing Center, you need to go to our web page. Okay. So if you search UIowa Writing Center in your Google search bar, the first link that will come up is to our Writing Center homepage. If you scroll down, you will notice that we have three services, and two of these services are probably most helpful for you. One is our online feedback service. Through this portal, if you click on this, pink circle, uh, you can submit a document of up to 15 pages and you will receive within about three days, uh, if it's not too crowded, uh, electronic feedback from one of our two T's. And you can also make an appointment. Now if you want to make an appointment, you can click on that circle and you'll be taken to this page. If you haven't been to see us before, You'll need to register for an account. You'll fill in your name, your last name, first name, last name, email address, etc. And then once you've registered for an account, you can log into our system. When you log in, you'll be taken to a schedule that looks like this. Unfortunately, spring break is next week, so um, we can't see what is available soon, but after spring break, it looks like there are a lot of appointments open. If an appointment is blue, like this, it means that that appointment is taken. If it is white, that means that it is open and free for you to select. And um, so you can make an appointment with Brady at 1.30 per se. So that's how you make an appointment at the Writing Center. And like I said, I encourage you to take advantage of this resource. Uh, writing support services can cost up to 50 or $60 sometimes, and these writing services here at the University of Iowa are free for all faculty and students. So um, I encourage you to use them. So the first topic on our agenda is defining a research question. So this is a place where a lot of people get stuck right at the beginning, and I think that that is in part because there's a misconception that inspiration for topics just comes to you or that you can think of a research topic by just staring into space or staring at your computer. Um, but really it is important that research is something that you do not only once you have a research topic but also in order to get you to a research topic or to help you identify what you want to research. So I suggest an approach for any type of research paper in any discipline of research, refine, and repeat. And by that I mean that you start with research. So you might identify a general topic that you're interested in, say respiratory disease. And then you would do some preliminary research on that topic. That research would hopefully help you decide how you can narrow down that research topic into, say, age group or socioeconomic status so that you already have a more defined topic of inquiry. Then, once you have defined your inquiry a little bit a little bit more, 
you can research according to those parameters. So for example, you would research respiratory disease in um, middle class elderly. And then you would conduct more research. And when you're in, at this step in the process, you want to be starting to think about what conversations are going on around this d more refined topic. What are people saying? What have people already said? Who is citing each other? What conversations are existing in the field? And what, might thi what things might have been ignored? Or what things have not been sufficiently covered? Or what things have been covered in a way that you find problematic? And that is where you want to intervene with your research project. You want to find a certain sort of gap or something that you can contribute to a conversation that already exists. And that is when you will do your final refining to identify some sort of research question or hypothesis that you can, that can jumpstart your research. So a lot of times, a scientific paper seems like a big, giant monster. And it's difficult to know how to break up the different sections. Um, you may be very familiar with this. This may be new. But I'm going to go through the basic sections of a scientific paper. If you want more information, I have some resources linked over here. And these will provide more comprehensive explanation of what I will summarize here. So the scientific paper is broken up into the following parts. First, we have the abstract, which is an overall summary of the paper in all of its different sections. That is about 150 words. Gives your readers a snapshot of what they will find within to decide if they want to read the entire thing. In the introduction, we usually have a literature review. And that will provide a summary of all of the relevant literature, the studies that you read and you, you um, archived in your research how they're speaking to each other, and what they're leaving out. And hopefully, that will be what you will address in your, in your paper. So you'll identify the gap, and then you'll maybe point towards your hypotheses. The next section is a material and methods, materials and methods section. Um, this is where you're going to talk about how you conducted your study, what data you used, how you got it, what analyses you conducted on that data so that someone could replicate this, ex this study if they wanted to. You'll talk about the results of your study in, not surprisingly, a section called results. Um, this is where you will go through your findings. A lot of times it's helpful to have this section subdivided into different categories of results to make it more manageable and more meaningful for your reader. And the discussion and the conclusion sections are sections in which you unpack your results. You talk about what they mean or how they converse with the conversation that you mapped in your literature review in the introduction. You're speaking about your results in a bigger way, why they matter. And you go through each finding and discuss its implications and its implications for broader, for the field at large. This al also, especially in your conclusion, might be places where you talk about limitations of your study, things that you couldn't do, things that you didn't do, and relatedly, future directions for research. Knowing what you know now after conducting your, your paper, after finishing your paper, what can people do in the future? The references list comes at the end. And this is a summary um, a list in APA citation of the, your sources consulted and the data that you've included. So, one suggestion or general tip for learning more about the structure and organization of the scientific articles you will be um, trying to emulate is to actually read through the articles that you're using as sources as examples and look at them in order to become familiar with the, with the structure, with the format, um, with the way that people are writing about the issues that you hope to write about, and how they're organizing each section, what seems to be the purpose of each. This is really the best way to learn how to write a scientific article, is to read many samples and decide what you think is most effective. Uh, it's a really good idea to ask your professor for recommendations of journals that he or she respects. So I just went through the structure of a scientific paper, but that's not necessarily how you should approach it. Starting with the abstract would be a very difficult thing to do. So I've consulted with some of my friends who do write many scientific papers or scientific articles for some suggestions about um, in which order to complete these different 
these different subparts of your paper. Many of my friends will start with um, researching outside sources and mapping or drafting at least loosely the literature review for the introduction, but not really writing the introduction in full and at least not polishing it because you want to talk about your materials and methods and your results before you do so. So that's the next step. Talk about how you got your data, how you analyzed your data, and then consider how you want to articulate and lay out and discuss your results. And then you can go back and finish your introduction once you have a firmer grasp of what you're actually going to say in your paper. And this will prepare you to write your discussion and your conclusion. And only then when you've actually articulated and, and think you know what the implications, the broader implications of your study are, should you go back and write your abstract, which is going to point to those implications at its close. And then you can finish with writing your reference list. Though some people prefer to have an ongoing, to be working on their reference list ongoing throughout the, um, throughout the process. So as I mentioned, some of your sections, like for example your, your, your results section or your discussion or slash conclusion sections, will be divided into um, subsections that take your reader through the narrative of your findings. It's really important to be intentional about the order in which you place your information within each section as well and to make sure that that has a logical organization that guides your reader through the different portions of your research. In general, when I'm, whenever I'm advising people to think about how they want to organize a large quantity of information, I recommend you play around with different options through post-it notes. So you might write different possible subsections, different sort of categories of your research that you want to discuss and put them each on a post-it note and then play around with how they could be reordered, how putting one subsection before another might shift the way you're talking about your results so that you can find the best sequence um, for your reader. This can also be done more traditionally in an outline form. This is better for adding details if you want to get really detailed with your structure before you actually start writing. And sometimes an outline like this can really comfort writers and feel like they have a road map so that the actual blank page on a screen feels less intimidating. A sort of hybrid between the two, a hybrid between this type of outline that, that with Roman numerals and numbers and letters and the casual post-it notes are note cards, which you can write more details on, but you can also move around, like you can move around post-it notes, which I love to do. So we've been talking a lot about overarching structural issues, organization, et cetera, but my specialty and my favorite thing to talk about is really issues of writing style and strategies for scientific writing. So some characteristics of good scientific writing include clarity, that the writing is simple and direct, that it is smoothly and logically structured, and that it is precise and accurate. And all of these things might sound really great, but of course the question is, how do you accomplish this? So we'll talk about that for the next couple of minutes. So to make your writing clear, I advise to first of all, avoid ambiguous pronouns, words like it, they, that, these, and those, etc., that are, that are filling the place of a noun, but you're not necessarily specifying what that noun is. And if you use these words, only use them when followed by a specific noun. For example, these findings. Also, it's important to avoid jargon and unnecessarily difficult vocabulary. Oftentimes, you sound smarter if you use basic words, everyday words that really clearly communicate your ideas to your reader. Um, use words that you know your o intended audience would find familiar. And this is why it's important to read the journals that you're, that you're modeling after as samples because you'll get a sense for the discourse or the types of words that that journal is using and that its audience would find familiar, like I said. So an unclear sentence, a bad example, would be the following. The governmental monetary expenditure for adolescent pregnancy and childbirth is, according to their estimates, 9.4 billion. Additionally, they are a lot of times preterm. 
So here we have some jargony, long, unnecessarily complex phrases. We also have some ambiguous pronouns, there and they, who are these there and they, we're unsure. A sentence like this can be made much clearer by eliminating these problems and saying, quite simply, government costs for teen childbearing is estimated at $9.4 billion. Teen pregnancies often result in preterm births. The they is replaced with the exact noun phrase that it's meaning to be replaced by, and we've more simply said government costs instead of governmental monetary expenditure. A related piece of advice is to make your writing direct. So by that we mean avoid overly complex sentences with unnecessary details or embedded clauses. We're taught when we're little to write really simple sentences like see Scott run and then we add more and more and more and now as you're trying to become a clear and more direct writer we want to trim back on those those phrases that clog up your writing. So try to minimize the number of what I call little words, words like of and to be and and, um, and phrases that begin with those words because the, those words really tend to clutter up writing quite quickly. And only use adjectives and adverbs when they're absolutely necessary. So a sentence like this, when looking at the figures, we surprisingly found that Texas, the state with the highest raw number of teen pregnancies, also had, when adjusted for population density, the highest rates per 1,000 births, we can eliminate a lot in that sentence. We have a couple of embedded clauses. That means here there are two commas. We have a little extra information in here, an embedded clause, another one here. We also have some adverbs, and we have some phrases that are just quite simply not necessary. We don't need to know that when you are looking at the figures, you found something. We, it's implied that you were looking at the figures. So therefore, a much more direct example might be, even when adjusted for population density, Texas had the highest teen pregnancy rates. Everyone comes into the writing center wanting to know how to make their paper flow, and by that they often mean that they want their paper to be smooth and logical. And there are techniques that you can use to make your prose smooth and logical. One is to make sure that every step in your explanations and your rationale is explained in detail. I always say explain as though you're explaining to a smart but inattentive kindergartner who doesn't like to pay attention to you. You want to make sure that you're explaining every step of how you got to each conclusion. One way you can help is by using signposts, which are words like first, second, additionally, etc., in order to indicate the direction of, of your ideas. If you want to check and see, if you need to add more information, if you need to explain things more clearly, or if you need to be, uh, make some intentional choices about how to make your writing sm smoother, is to ask a friend or a family member, per particularly one who is not familiar with your research topic, to read through your paper. And then ask him or her to underline or put a squiggly mark next to, or star, parts that seem unclear and confusing. These are places then where you know you need to either rephrase or add some information that will make your logic come through more easily. Finally, <clears throat> we recommend that for scientific writing especially, you want your, your writing to be precise and accurate. And to do this, avoid vague words that indicate claims that are uncertain, words like almost or probably or seem to. And it's also helpful to try and sound objective and avoid words that indicate whether something is good or something is bad. And avoid large sweeping generalizations about people or history. It's always best to be specific rather about a demographic or a location rather than referring to everyone or something that has happened throughout all time. So in this following example, we can see several problems. Everyone knows teen pregnancy is a problem. Everyone knows is this one of these generalizations I'm talking about. Words like problem and luckily indicate a lack of objectivity. And we have the vague word seems to be here. So a better example would state in the past 10 years, teen pregnancy rates in the United States have decreased, decreased from and then list the parameters. 
Now these questions of style and of writing strategies are really best considered not when you're drafting, but when you're revising and editing. If you're thinking too much about how every sentence is crafted when you start to write your paper, it might really slow you down. So these are things that you want to look at when you're reading through your paper after at least a draft of it has been completed. But there's a difference between revising and editing, and both are important process processes for polishing up your paper. So we're going to talk about the differences of, between the, the two and talk about strategies for each. So after you have a complete draft, you want to first revise. That means making changes to structure, to organization, and to content. Questions that you might want to ask when you're revising include, are my claims and my arguments consistent throughout the whole paper? Do my materials and methods match up with my results, which match up with my discussion and my conclusion? Is there a unity that ties the entire paper together? Similarly, is the tone and the writing style consistent throughout the paper? This is especially important if you're working on a group paper and multiple students have collaborated on one draft. You want to make sure it sounds like one person has written the entire thing. That can usually be accomplished by having one person go through and do some of the editing and revising on their own. And is my organization logical? which areas need more clarity and explanation. And that's what we were talking about with having someone who is unfamiliar with the topic go through and identify places that need more, more explanation. When you're done with revision, you want to do some editing. That's sentence level changes, identifying grammar mistakes, typos, issues with citation, and formatting inconsistencies. Sometimes people get caught up doing editing before they've done revising. And this is not recommended because you might end up changing, spending a lot of time changing sentences and altering little typos, etc., to parts of the paper that might be cut or significantly altered. So always start with revision and then move to editing at the very last point stage in the process. So questions to ask when editing include, do I have any spelling or grammatical errors? Is the formatting consistent throughout my paper? Are, am I using um, the same, are my headings consistent, for example? Are my figures and graphs polished, professional, easy to read, and accurate? And is my paper free of typos and citation errors? Typos are really easy to make and really easy to fix, and they also can really diminish your credibility as a writer. So it's important to do a couple of read-throughs in order to catch those. I also recommend when editing, especially copy editing, looking for typos and little mistakes, to start from the last sentence of your paper and work backwards. That really helps you not focus on the content of your paper, the overall argument or overall organization. That you should have taken care of with revising. You want to start at the end to work backwards so that you don't get caught up in those things and you can identify the little mistakes that you find um, in each sentence. It also often helps to read aloud. You often will find mistakes that you don't find otherwise. I'm not going to spend much time talking about APA. To be honest, you probably know more about APA than I do. However, I will include some resources that you may find helpful if you're running into any problems or if you have any questions. For in-text citations, which is what we usually talk to with our writing 2Ts at the Writing Center, you want to include, if you're quoting, the author, the year of publication, and the page number for the reference. The page number would proceed, be preceded by P, for example, here. And for paraphrases and summaries, the page number is optional. But we're always going to be needing to know who the researchers are. If it's three or more, it would be Jones et al. And then we also always need to know, in some form, the date of the publication. Now, as I said, what I will mostly be useful for you probably is me giving you some references that you can consult with for your more detailed questions about APA. If you are looking for resources on your reference list, you can select either of these. Headings and general formatting, so what the paper should in general look like. Look at these samples down here on the bottom. And for tables and figures, here are a couple of resources that may be helpful to you. 
If you have any questions about anything we've talked about today or you have any ideas that you'd like to run by me, please contact me. Again, my name is Kate Nesbitt. My email is katherinesbitt at uiowa.edu. You can also go to the Writing Center webpage or email the Writing Center at writingcenter at uiowa.edu. And I wish you happy writing. Can you describe a rubric which outlines features of a well-written scientific paper? I'll do my best. I've never graded a scientific paper, but um, the, the subcategories that I would include are first, a sort of internal consistency. So a coherency within sections, um, arguments that are followed throughout, that everything works logically together, and someone could read the paper and come away and explain it in two to three minutes to someone else um, with, with little problem. The second would be demonstration of subject mastery. So a sort of demonstration of expertise, evidence that you are well read in the relevant literature, a familiarity with the vocabulary of the field, a familiarity with the state of the field. That's a sort of that's the sort of content section of it that you that you demonstrate that you're that you're well informed. Um, as far as writing goes, so I in all of my papers for whatever course I'm teaching, I always include a writing style and mechanics section of a rubric. And for a scientific paper, that would include I would grant points for writing that communicated meaning as clearly as possible. Uh, clarity is is the word that that people keep coming back to that you really want you really want to convey without ambiguity the ideas that you're discussing. And similarly, in both writing and in general formatting, you want consistency and polish. So you want um, it to be error-free, which seems obvious, but is actually quite difficult to manage. And you want um, all of your citation to be consistent. You want your headings to be consistent. You want your figures to look professional. Uh, so, so those are things that would go under a sort of polish or, or um, mechanics subheading. How can these principles of writing be applied to other assignments like proposals, work plans, or case studies? Absolutely, that's a great question. And I think, as I talked about in our writing support video, I think one of the most important things you can do to become a good writer in whichever field is to read the type of item, the type of document that you want to write and read a lot of them. So if you're wanting to write an article, read a lot of scientific articles. If you're wanting to write a proposal, read a lot of proposals and become familiar with the conventions of the genre. You might even want to have a notepad next to you while you're reading them and start taking notes on certain things that all authors do. Oh, they all start in a memo with an executive summary and this is what the executive summary does. Um, so that you notice the consistencies between all of the examples that you're reading and you notice where they differ so that you can so that you notice where you do have wiggle room to make your own artistic decisions. So that is my main suggestion is to read and take notes on whatever um, type of type of writing you want to do. Secondly, as I've already talked before, I'm going to be like the clear cheerleader, but clarity is consistent throughout all the genres you mentioned, proposals, um, fellowship requests, memos, anything like that, always you're going to want to be as, as clear as possible and especially in the first sentence of every paragraph. I always say you want your first and the last sentence of every paragraph to just sparkle with clarity because those, if you're skimming or if you're reading quickly, which quite frankly people do a lot with a lot of the genres you mentioned, you they're going to be looking at first and last sentences. So if you're going to concentrate your efforts anywhere, that's where it should be. Perfect. In addition to the web pages cited in your presentation, are there other resources that students and professionals should have handy? For example, site, manage, site management systems like EndNote seem to be used by writers a lot. 
Any comments? Yes. So to start with EndNote, EndNote is a fantastic way to um, collect the archive of research materials that you're using to have a sort of uh, system in which you have in one place the various resources that you want to cite, or at least summaries of those. Um, so that's a fantastic, a fantastic resource. I also use Evernote as a note-taking software. Um, that's I think it was originally used or designed for like recipe collections or something like that. But I use it to organize my note, the notes on my sources for my own research. So um, that doesn't necessarily, it's not a citation, uh, citation manager, but it's good for note-taking if you're interested in that. Um, as far as writing resources, I know Duke's Graduate College has a really good website for scientific writing. So a lot of the ideas that I've been talking about are discussed in length um, through resources they provide. So if you want more, that's a good place to start. Uh, a classic writing style guide that's um, acknowledged as an authority across disciplines is Strunk and White's um, I think it's like elements, elements of style, I believe. Um, I have it on my, on my bookcase, but of course I don't know the title precisely. But everyone kind of refers to that and references it, and it's a, it's a nice base text for um, nice lean prose. And also, um, let's see, what else was I going to recommend? Oh, I was going to say this. I think in the age of the internet where we have so much material really readily accessible, there is there are so there's so much information available to you about writing on just through a Google search, a Google search. So if you're struggling with anything, if you're struggling with a certain part of uh, your paper, if you're starting with a certain part of the process of writing, if you're struggling with a certain genre, if you do some Googling and you find some blogs or you find some um, university web pages with resources, those can sometimes be the most useful places and you can refine your search in order to tailor to your concerns. So this is more of just a really obvious um, suggestion that I think we sometimes forget about. Becoming a better writer can be as simple as just doing some research on your own through the resources either your school or, your, or Google has at your disposal. You've touched on, in the video and in the tutorial, use of endnotes and also this sort of incremental approach. Have mm. an idea, uh, research a little more of the literature. Yeah. Uh, refine your idea, research a little bit more. Yeah. Can you talk about how we should deal with writer's block? Yes. I have so much experience with writer's block. Um, and I write a lot, so it's a problem. Um, some suggestions for how to deal with writer's block. One, when you're experiencing writer's block, don't write, read. I, I recommend always going, if I'm feeling stuck at the computer, I always switch to reading. And that, what I mean by that is researching. So if you're feeling stuck, a lot of times doing more research or reading other people's ideas will spark an idea in your brain or will help you think about where you want to go next. Um, another idea is when you are experiencing writer's block or maybe after you've done a little bit of research, do low stakes writing. So something like a free write on a notebook or um, maybe some brainstorming with post-it notes or something that is not at the computer feeling like every sentence that you write is what's going to go into your final paper. So low stakes writing. Uh, and then my final suggestion is kind of weird, but it really helps me which is do something active. So a lot of times when I am experiencing writer's block, I'll go for a run, or I will go for a walk, or I will cook, or I will do something that takes just enough of my brain away from my, from my research that I'll be able to um, somehow think more freely. I think writer's block is a form of anxiety, and so it's an overworking of the brain. It's not the brain working not enough. And so distraction can sometimes, a little bit of distraction can, can sometimes really help you think. Excellent. Yeah. Any other thoughts or advice for uh, technical writers? One would be, okay, so general advice would be seek help um, and seek advice from mentors, from people who are experienced writers. Um, a lot of, I have a lot of 
graduate students in the sciences, a lot of technical and scientific writers who come into the writing center. And they always start off, the first thing they say is, I'm a horrible writer. And I think in some ways that's the first the first hump to get over is to actually not see yourself as a bad writer who just has to write to convey your ideas. But as someone, as the writing is sort of part of the challenge um, and one that everyone struggles with. It's, if, if you're struggling with writing, well then that doesn't mean you're a bad writer at all. Um, and the other note to that is I was once told that there are no good writers, there are only good revisers. And the more I write, the more I think that that is true, that everyone's first drafts are pretty bad. And everyone's writing is pretty bad at some point because our, our ideas are kind of muddled and crazy. So of course our writing is going to be kind of muddled and crazy. So what you really want to work on in order to become a good writer isn't necessarily having that first draft that you print off be great, but instead be able to go through your writing and identify where there are awkward moments or where you don't like what you're hearing so that you can try and work on changing it. Um, yeah. On behalf of students from the College of Public Health and other viewers of this, thank you so much. You're welcome.